A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Last week, I began telling you the story about one of the wildest nights in my career. The date was July 21st, 1989, and someone, or someones, had stolen FBI equipment, including a handy talkie, from an FBI agent's car. The thief was communicating with us on the walkie-talkie, And by communicate, I mean he was making vile suggestions that I won't repeat now. Go back and listen to the last episode if you need to refresh your memory. And of course, in typical me fashion, I had taken it upon myself to get the equipment back. And how did I intend to do that, you ask? Simple. By becoming the first madam of the FBI and using my fellow female agents as bait. So once again, grab a glass or another glass of wine or coffee and get ready for the end of the story. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing and I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is The Candy Store, Part 2. So just to recap, Candace had a plan. You had a plan. You were going to be a madam, so to speak, and your fellow FBI agents were going to pretend to be sex workers. So what did Ron and Lane think about this? They laughed. <laughs> but, <laughs> but did they do it? They, they actually weren't laughing at me. They were laughing with me. And the crocodile, he said he loved the idea. And he said, Candace, I'll give you whatever support you need to pull this off. Ron, my friend, definitely wanted in on the deal. So how did you go about becoming this madam? That was a little detail I hadn't worked out. But I said to Ron, I asked him, line up about 10 female agents who were at their desks. And there were, at that time, I think there might have been 25, 20, 25 female agents in the division. And find 10 of them and give them a handy talkie. And I would transmit periodically to them for the sole purpose of the bad guy thinking I was doing what I said. I was going to tell the bad guy I'm a madam, right? Well, what does a madam do? She talks to her girls so that I would transmit over the radio so that the bad guy that had our radio would hear it. So how did you get back in touch with him? Okay, so I went from Lane's office back down to the radio room. Ron was with me. And I went up to Lynn and I said, I am relieving you. And Oh, I bet she was happy. Yes, I do recall. I think her hand was shaking. She'd been through the ringer for a few hours now. and uh, She wasn't an agent, right? I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There are two types of employees with the FBI, support agents and FBI agents that carry guns and badges. And for every one agent, there's two to three support employees. When she got up out of her chair and walked away from the radio station and I sat in it, something unusual happened. 
all the agents who had been reluctant to stick out their own neck now seemed to be resentful that someone else was stepping into the ring with the blessing of management. Well, it's too bad. They should have stepped up way before you even got back to the office. Yeah, well, my thoughts exactly. But what I was thinking at the time was, okay, so this case, it's a hot potato to be sure. But whatever agent succeeded in breaking off the standoff and getting our stuff back would be praised. That wasn't what I was thinking at the time. I just wanted to have some fun and get our stuff back. So this is a potentially, as you said, a career buster. Why did you choose to stick your neck out for it? I'm a late blooming thrill seeker (laughs) and it looked really fun to me. It looked like great fun. And you have to have fun with the job. I was elated that I was chosen to do this. Of course, there was a little voice inside me going, you better pull this off. (laughs) Well, so you took over. Did he immediately radio you or did you have to reach out to him? Actually, at this point, we hadn't heard from him in about an hour. So I needed to smoke him out, if you will. So I started checking in and putting air quotes around checking in with my girls. We agreed that we were all going to use our real first names. I'm scared to ask you. You didn't want to ever be called Candy again. Was this an exception? We agreed that we were all going to use our real first names. And for the sake of the cause, I revived the nickname that no one in the previous four to five years of my bureau life had ever been permitted to utter Candy. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to say it. In case you guys haven't heard the episode on Killer Psyche Daily, she has an episode called Don't Call Me Candy. And you can see why she dislikes the nickname so much. I recommend listen to the Daily Show. Yes. Anyway, I placed my first call to Cindy and Linda, two female agents, because they both had really charming feminine Southern accents. I gave Cindy her assignment and she signed off by saying, you got it, candy girl. Oh, dear. (laughs) Yeah. Had I been able to crawl under the radio desk, I would have. Oh, candy girl, don't be (laughs) shy. (laughs) Linda pretended to copy the address of a high roller on Lakeshore Drive. And she closed by actually saying, okay, I read you, candy mama. You must have been dying. Oh, once again, I cringed. Cringing came back in style that afternoon. I hated (laughs) to be called Candy. I really did. But I have to say, the name certainly seemed suited to this job, not the profession that I think my parents had in mind when they named me Candace. Probably not. So I waited a decent interval between my calls to Cindy and Linda, and there was still no word from a lover boy that had our handy talkie. I was wondering if he had tired of this little game he was playing. Or worse, could he be contemplating some diabolical use for the stolen handy talkie? Maybe the batteries had gone dead. That would have been the worst thing to happen. And we were all worried about that. I was starting to worry about that quite a bit when I checked in with my third girl, the Ice Woman. That's her nickname. That was a female agent that I work with, and that was her nickname. And she said, what's up, can-do candy woman? Do you have something for me? Can-do candy woman? Where'd she get that from? Well, me. (laughs) I didn't know at first, but I later learned she deliberately called me can-do candy woman as an expression of the confidence that the female agents in the call girl ring had in me. Oh, that's nice. I needed it. I needed that boost. It really cheered me tremendously. It did. And it came at a time when I, like I said, I really needed it. Anyway, so I said something to the effect of, yeah, I've got a hot one for you. And I decided I might as well have some fun with this. And I said, it's Big Daddy Fun Bucks again. That was a goofy name one of my brothers, Keith, jokingly called himself. 
I'm sure he's so happy that you just told that to our <laughs> to everybody. How did you keep a straight face? Did everyone just start laughing at that point? Well, fortunately, as soon as I made the transmission, I took my thumb off the button, you know, to talk. And whoever, because yes, there was laughter all around. I was, like Lynn was, I was surrounded by people in the radio room. But I was... I was nervous. I didn't see it as all that funny. And then when everybody burst out laughing, I turned around and I said, shush, but I'm afraid I offended some delicate souls because when they all left the radio room, I heard one of them say, bitch. Wow. Okay. That's okay. I was raised by a Navy officer and three brothers. So calling me a bitch was hardly an insult. In fact, I took it as a challenge. I would take it as a compliment, Candace. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you're taking charge and taking names, so. So, yeah, there's that. Anyway, when I said that to the ice woman, she actually, and I'm not kidding, she squealed. She said, oh, he knows how to have a good time. And then I heard another voice on the line, quote, eat me, not him, eat me. <sighs> I know. Okay. He was back. The sweetheart. What, what a pickup. The, what a pickup line, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the sweetheart of the stolen FBI radio was back and as smooth as ever. <laughs> so I said, who is this? Are you the guys who stole my girl's walkie-talkie? Silence. Silence. I was terrified. I thought I'd scared him off. At first, it was just minutes. And that stretched into an hour. Plenty of time for me to question my sanity forever, ever climbing out on such a visible and shaky limb as this idea. I could just see it. The entire division was listening to me make a fool of myself. How'd you keep going? Did you just Mm. sit there and wait for him to come back on? Did anyone help you? No, I was still, I was by myself. I kept trying to raise him on the radio, but I wasn't having any luck. Well, all those officers, the ones that were probably listening to you or that were resentful, did any of them offer to help you? Well, actually, without me even asking, an agent that I worked with, his name was John, just slid in beside me grabbed a chair, and slid right up next to me. Let me describe John to you. He was a really, really fine agent. Great guy, nice guy. Tall, once again, he was about 6'3", and I considered him a trusted friend. What did he say? He said, I'll keep you company, candy woman. Oh, that must have made you cringe and feel happy at the same time. Yes, once again, it was cringe time. But I have to say, Julie, it was the boost I needed. John urged me to try to get, at this point, we were calling him Loverboy, try to get Loverboy to call on the landline in the radio office so that we could do a trap and trace and find out where the call was coming from. Otherwise, what we all feared would happen might happen, that the batteries in his radio, well, I mean, our radio that he had, would die. And then John said to me, He will call Candace. Yes, he called me Candace. He said, and it was just what I needed to hear. He said, your scam is going great. And then he said, who do you think he is? So he's asking you basically to profile. Yeah, who did I think I was dealing with? And I remember saying, well, he sounds young to me and non-white. It was hard to discern actually, over the radio, what his accent was, but it seemed like he was Asian or possibly Hispanic. I just couldn't tell. And then I remember saying to John, but I don't think this guy's over 20 years old. The things he's saying and the behavior is not something you'd expect to see in an older man. It's something a teenager would do, somebody having fun. So that's who I think we're dealing with. So did he call? Well, not at first, but Ron, remember Ron from the original meeting in 
Lane Crocker's office. Yeah. He joined John and I just in time to hear Loverboy return on the radio. And he said in this seductive whisper, I want to eat you. Oh, God. Where did this guy come up with his pickup lines? Okay. So then what did you say to him? I said, I want my radio. We'll eat later. And who am I talking to anyway? (laughs) What did he say? He said, who the hell are you? And he had some attitude going there. John passed me a note to get him to call on the phone. And what that meant was I was to try to get him to call on the phony FBI phone in the radio office that would only be answered with the word hello, not FBI, can I help you? In fact, we called that phone the hello phone. Anyway, I said back to our guy, I said, I am Miss Candy. Look, mystery man, I don't like talking on the radio. Call me on the phone. And then I gave him the phone number. And he said, fuck you, bitch. And then he was gone. Wow. So was that it? Well, not quite. I think that was about at least the second and possibly the third time I'd been called a bitch since arriving at the impound lot six hours ago. And it was getting kind of old. But I thought I just punched the button so I could talk again as if he had not signed off. I said, look, your batteries are about to run down. And if that happens, then we can't reach each other. So call me. I gave him a number and said, let's make a deal. You get a girl for the night. And I'll give you cash for the radio and my camera stuff. Wow, he was getting a deal. I thought so. What did he say? He said, what's the name of your outfit? What was the name of your outfit? Well, I wasn't expecting that question. So I just blurted out the candy store. I hadn't even been (laughs) thinking about it. I could (laughs) see, yeah, I know. I know, I know. I'm my own worst enemy. And I could see from the look on John's face that I had just made myself major joke bait. Oh, yeah. You never lived that down, did you? No, no, I did not. So I repeated the phone number. And once again, he clicked off. Now, Illinois Bell had rigged the phone to trap and trace the call. But in 1980, the technology being what it was, I would have to keep him on the phone for a full three minutes if he called back in order to trace the call. Three minutes. That's a long time. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like a long time, but I know from recording, three minutes is quite a bit of material. Yeah. Well, and factor in that I was under uh, tremendous stress at this point. Anyway, so I went back to calling out my girls just in case he was listening. And then I noticed some little bit of a conversation about 10 feet behind me. And I turned around and I noticed that Ron had been pulled out of the room by one of the FBI supervisors. And I caught occasional traces of arguing from the hall. And I heard Ron saying, no, no. And I disagree. She's doing fine. Oh, good for Ron. Bad for the supervisor. Bad supervisor. Well, it was later after I badgered Ron that he finally told me that the supervisor, along with a few others, were managing a campaign to convince Lane Crocker to let them take over the case. Oh, by the way, not that they had come up with any better idea. And Ron just said, he's a jerk. So I just told him to screw off. And I have to say, that put a smile on my face. Well, in light of everything, you've had a lot of smiles on your face that day. Yeah. (laughs) Finally, the audience began to trickle away, and I looked up and saw that it was six o'clock. Time to head home to dinner and families. And I thought, oh, good. Everybody's leaving. The fewer witnesses to my downfall, the better. So I'm assuming he called back. He did at about 645. And was I grateful? Yeah, I would bet. So I asked him, what do you want? And he said, I want $800 and the ice woman. But then I knew, Julie, then I knew I was dealing with a kid. Yeah. First of all, the handy talkie alone 
was worth over thousands of dollars and the camera equipment three times that. But to keep him on the phone, I dickered about the cash and insisted that the ice woman was busy. We hadn't worked out which female agent would come along with me because we had no way of knowing when or how the deal would go down. How did you keep him on the phone for three minutes without him getting suspicious? Well, just going back and forth about what he wanted, what I was willing to give. And then finally, John gave me a thumbs up, meaning it had been long enough for the trace to go through. But it turned out, Julie, we wouldn't need it. Why not? Well, my caller, he, you know, he was driving kind of a hard bargain and he was standing firm on the cash and the ice woman. And now he was insisting that his friend get a woman too. No deal. I said, no deal. One of my girls can handle both of you. I was getting into it. I admit. You were I in was, character, man. <laughs> I was getting into it. So here I am. I've just told him one of my girls can handle both of you. And I was wondering, who would I take with me? It was almost seven o'clock. I hope there was another woman somewhere around the office that I could press into service. And all of a sudden, there she was in black, tight, and I mean super tight, shiny pants and a pink satin camisole with spaghetti straps. In her high heels, she looked six feet tall. It was the ice woman. It turns out she had wanted to help out enough that just in case she was needed, she had gone home to change. And at that moment, she became my friend for life. So how were you going to find him, though? Did you guys arrange for a place to meet? Yeah, yeah. I told him I'd meet him for dinner with the ice woman at a restaurant in Chinatown, which was not too far from the office. And then I hung up. Oh, I bet all those agents had to eat crow then. Well, I don't know about that, but I do recall that people just burst into applause. And it was, it was such a relief. I'd been at the switchboard for six straight hours, and now it looked like it was coming to fruition. Earlier that afternoon, when I, I placed my daily three o'clock call to my son, Seth, I apologized for being out late, but I promised him, I promised I'd make it up to him with a really good story. Well, it looks like he's got one. I mean, you definitely were able to deliver on that. Yeah, we were on the way. Okay, so then we moved into phase two of the operation. One of the guys from the surveillance squad cased the restaurant, and on his advice, the ice woman and I sat at a booth very close to the door. Once the exchange was made, the money for the equipment, I was to signal the guys by taking off my white summer fedora and place it on the table. That would be a signal to Ron and five other male agents to move in and make the arrest. Here's the thing. Even though we believed we were going to be dealing with kids, and by kids, I mean teenagers, it didn't pay to take any chances. We had to plan for every eventuality. And here's the thing about teenagers when they commit a crime, they can be even more dangerous than adults because they are more likely to get what we call hinky, which means paranoid, and start shooting in situations that a more experienced criminal would have the confidence to navigate without bloodshed. So to relax, by thinking, oh, they're only kids. No, we all knew better. Okay, so Candace, you are meeting the thieves at a Chinese restaurant. What happened? The ice woman and I arrived early, and when we went in, we saw Ron and his squad mates at this big round table. And they were ordering what turned out to be a very impressive array of food. The ice woman and I took a table not too far from them, 
maybe about three or four feet, but where they would have a real good vantage point of everything going on. And then our clients arrived, two young Chinese men, neither of whom I think weighed as much as I did. I have to say, I was thinking, wait, 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 these puny little guys, I put my career on the line for this? Anyway, we introduced ourselves and they sat down and we ordered a few dishes as cover. Needless to say, I had no appetite at all, but we had to make it look good. One of the guys sat next to me and the other sat next to the ice woman across from me. Were they making small talk? Did they chat with you guys? Yeah, they were, they were trying to act tough and they were trying to look tough. And one of them, the guy next to me said, let's see the money. So below the tabletop level, I had the envelope in my hand and I nudged him with my elbow and to look down and I fanned my stack of $100 bills that I had in the envelope, eight $100 bills. And then I said, what about my stuff? They showed me the handy talkie and the camera equipment. And we surreptitiously made the swap under the table. And then the ice woman, unbeknownst to me, she had a plan and she played her role to the hilt. She said, what about me? What am I getting out of this? And she was like protesting. And she did it to distract the two guys until I could signal Ron and get the show on the road. I didn't want to wait. So I swept off my hat and laid it on the table. as kind of like as I was exasperated to have to argue with her. And then something happened. The waiter brought our order, blocking Ron's view of our table. If Ron had been looking at all, I he stole, was eating. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I stole a glance over at the guys, the surveillance squad and the arrest team, and they were all very absorbed in chatting and circulating dishes of food. I could hardly believe my eyes. I really, I thought, oh my gosh, this is my backup. Yeah, some backup, right? Yeah, this is my backup and pass the egg rolls. <laughs> So, oh my gosh. Well, I, so the signal was for you to take off your hat. I that know. was what the signal is? Okay. Yeah. I my, hat, make- my hat was already on the table and they weren't looking. They missed it. So I picked my hat back up and put it on so that I could signal them again, hoping they were paying better attention. Did your partner in this, the ice woman, did she understand what was going on? She did. She picked up on it and she kind of shifted gears. And now she was working on promising the boys a wild time after dinner. And I can assure you, they were listening. So we started to eat. I didn't know what else to do. We were eating with, I call them the kids. And I noticed they were kind of shifting restlessly in their seats, staring at us and looking at the door, the front door to the restaurant. And I just thought, I have to set this arrest in motion again because something's happening. There, there's some trouble going on outside. So once more, I took off my hat and I was waiting for all hell to break loose. And you know what happened? No. Nothing. Nothing <laughs> happened. Okay, this time I shot a suggestive look at Ron's table like I was trying to telepathically convince them, hey guys, look at us. But the kid across from me caught it. And he said, what's going on? And he yelled and jumped up. So I stood up as fast as I could. I grabbed his two wrists in my hands and slammed them down on the table. And I pinned them down with my own body weight. The ice woman had a look on her face. Her eyeballs just about popped out of her head. But she followed suit and did the same thing with the guy sitting across from her. So. Did Ron ever even join in? Did he realize what was happening at that point? (laughs) Well, remember, the first guy had said to me, hey, what's going on? What's up? And I said, what's up? Is you're under arrest, I shouted, FBI. And then I turned and said, hey, Ron, 
join in any time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Ron dropped his fork and the rest of the guys just swarmed over at our table and subdued the two suspects. Oh, did they apologize? They were just eating. Did they at all apologize? For- <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Ron said to me, Jesus, DeLong, what's the rush? Don't you like Chinese food? I was trying to enjoy a nice dinner on the G. And that was a term for the government. And I said, Ra, I couldn't wait. They're too antsy. And then I told them something's up. They kept looking out the door. So Ron and I immediately went to the restaurant entrance. And through the glass door, we spotted three more young men getting off motorcycles. They were heading our way. They had their hands shoved in their jackets, which made me think they had guns. They were there to check on their friends or maybe to roll the horse. That would be the ice woman in me. Well, did the boys, I, I'm calling them the boys, the I kids know. that were that were inside, did they seem like they were in a motorcycle gang or did they just seem like no. young kids? No, they didn't. But one of them kept looking at the door, so I thought something's going on. And I remember these three guys are walking toward the door, but they didn't know they were surrounded by FBI agents who were outside guarding us. And before any of them got inside, they were all taken down. I looked at Ron and I said, rumble in Chinatown. And he laughed. And just as we stepped outside, a Saturday night special, which is a 38 revolver, went flying in the scuffle and it just skittered underneath the car. Yes, they were armed. Were they pulling out their guns to shoot someone or would no, just get knocked they, out? They didn't get the chance. Somebody, uh. somebody had their gun out, but it got knocked out of his hand by an FBI agent. None too soon, I might add. Did you have to help them outside? No, no. The way I saw it, my job was done. I was exhausted. So I headed back to the office to get my things. Before I got to my desk, I stopped by the radio room to make one last broadcast to any diehard fans who might still be listening. As it turns out, there were plenty of them. (laughs) I'm sure. I would later learn that a substantial portion of the division had eaten dinner in their bureau cars that night, sitting in their driveways with the radio on just to keep up with the unfolding candy store drama. Then I said, this is Candy Mama. Suspects in custody, no shots fired. Time to go home. That's badass. That's good. I like that, Candace. (laughs) Did they all cheer? You know, I heard from some of the clerks and agents in the radio room, way to go. And they clapped, they applauded. And that's when the phone rang. It was Lane Crocker. I guess someone told him about my broadcast. And he said, oh, I felt so great. He said, well done, Candace. And he just bellowed it into the phone. He was at a retirement party at an FBI watering hole across the street. And I knew he was there, but that's the kind of guy he was. He was so generous to take time out from the party to congratulate me and everybody that was involved. I couldn't stop smiling all the way home. Oh, that's really nice. And he was the one that supported you. It's Yes, yes, he was. He bet on me and he won. He won that bet. Did it ever get leaked to the press or anybody else what had happened? Well, when I went in the office the next morning, I I wasn't even on my desk yet. And someone at their desk looked up and saw me and came over and they shoved a newspaper in my hands. And there it was in big black letters. FBI uses hooker scam to bust Asian burglary ring. Wow, that's cool. (laughs) I know. I couldn't believe my eyes. It seemed that our little gang of six had grown rather notorious for what their smash and grabs were doing. They were breaking into cars, grabbing everything they could, and then fencing the contents for cash. The police were able to link them to dozens of similar thefts and recovered thousands of dollars worth of stolen property. That's awesome. And it was all because you took that chance. Well, it wasn't just me. But I have to say, the taxpayers got their money's worth. The Chicago cops were delighted to have the gang behind bars. And as for the FBI, well, we were spared the embarrassment 
of being terrorized by a teenage potty mouth. So did they tease you mercilessly about the candy store like we thought they would? Yes, they did. I would be known as the can-do candy woman for years. Now I know what to call you when I get mad. Don't you dare. (laughs) What would you have done if it didn't work out? I probably would have sent my 13-year-old son into the office with my credentials to resign on my behalf. Ah, nice, Candace. Real nice. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media. Wondery.